Out front tonight, absolute evil, absolute stupidity. Those are the exact words of Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky after a cultural center outside Kharkiv was destroyed by a Russian missile. You can see the strike right there. It's a cultural center and fireball that then follows, debris raining down. Ukrainians who were driving by at the time of the strike later seen running for their lives as the cloud of black smoke rises behind them. And today's attack coming as Ukraine's forces have been successful overall in pushing Russian forces back specifically from Kharkiv. And tonight we have dramatic new body cam footage that shows the fierce fight taking place outside what is the second biggest city in Ukraine. Those bruising battles that Russia continues to lose is partly why some of Putin's top commanders have been fired, relieved of duty because they're considered to have, quote, performed poorly during the initial stages of the unprovoked invasion. An invasion that failed to capture Kyiv and has gone downhill in many areas from there. Anti-war protests becoming more fearless, although the United States still says tonight that the, the U.S. does not believe public opinion in Russia will persuade Putin to end his invasion, even when the criticism is from a former Russian colonel. I must say, let's not drink information tranquilizers, because sometimes information is spread about hearing some moral or psychological breakdown of Ukraine's armed forces, as if they are nearing a crisis of morale or a fracture. None of this is close to reality. Now, that colonel said all those things on Russian state television. It was shocking, but then backtracked and said any talk of a Ukrainian counterattack is a, quote, big exaggeration, getting right back into the fold. Nick Peyton Walsh is out front. He is live in Kharkiv tonight. And Nick, what is the latest on the ground there? Yeah, certainly interesting news today about the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol, which Russia claims it has now completed the liberation of. Obviously, that's their ridiculous term for its essential destruction and the persecution of those therein. At the same time, Ukraine says it's given the order to stop that plant's defence. So possibly that ongoing a uh, heroic, frankly, defiant stats, uh, stance of Ukrainian forces in that port city may be coming to an end around the country. In the east, around Donbass and Luhansk, we are seeing possible slight incremental Russian advances and Ukraine pushing Russian forces back around here, the second largest city of Kharkiv. But still, as Russia retreats, extraordinary destruction often unleashed in its wake, as we saw just outside the city over the last two days. Putin would choke the light and life out of here. We are driving into the smoke of an incendiary munitions attack, we're told here, against this civilian village. Homes, fields, even the air itself torched. Vera says she saw it falling from the sky and her neighbor hit. <laughs> The incendiary munition, which burns hot through everything in its path, came after heavy normal shelling, which makes you question, like so much here, exactly why Russia needed to heap fire on top of heavy explosive. It hit just 10 minutes ago, this man says, pointing the way. Some left bewildered, others in the first moments of shock. <laughs> Valentina is very matter of fact as she describes what happened to Victor in her neighbor's house. She shows us the courtyard where a dead man lies, a large hole in his chest, an ear torn off. She points to the body just behind the tree and then says who he is. <laughs> v 
Victor had rushed to check on their neighbor's home. Russia occupied here for weeks, and as it retreats, these tiny corners of green are where it visits its anger. Up the road, towards Russia's last positions before the border, the shells land even closer. Natalia's husband died in shelling weeks ago, and her house is, like almost everything here, ruined. For the weeks when here was occupied, she lived across the street from an enormous Russian base. Our guides from Ukrainian Rapid Response Unit are cautious. Fighting is intensifying up the road, and they know the Russians got comfortable here. One Mayak. Their base even needed this aircraft warning device up high to tell Russian jets it was friendly. This is their problem each time they move forward. Here they are in what was once a Russian position, and look, look all around you. Impossible to know who's really in control of this area, with a fight happening just on the other side of the hill. The smell of corpses among the pines. Under every footstep, the threat of mines. Everywhere you look, foxholes, ammunition boxes, clearly a significant Russian base here. They're calling it a little town, using this forest as cover, but clearly hit really hard. The tomb of the unknown Russian soldiers, this says. Ghoulish relics here, where it once buzzed with the brutish, clumsy task of besieging a city. Smouldering in the trees here, but swallowed in their tall silence. It's important to remember, Erin, as we hear the story around Ukraine, talk more about the stalemate here, about the tiny gains made, about how possibly Ukraine will essentially, through better NATO weaponry, maybe begin to feel it's coming out on top. None of that reduces the kind of damage that we're seeing Russia do in its retreat when it feels it's losing, when it feels frustrated. Even here in Kharkiv, that's been breathing so much more easily over the past weeks, each night we hear heavy explosions in the distance, just now, in fact. And that is essentially what people fear here Moscow is going to do, even if it loses, cause as much damage as it possibly can to ordinary life here, Erin. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Nick, with that incredible report. And I want to go now to retired Army Lieutenant General Mark Kirtling, the former commanding general of Europe and the Seventh Army. So, General, when you see Nick's piece and, and this utter destruction, um, Russia attacked with phosphorus on top of shelling. And as they leave, I mean, you know, we saw places where they, you know, they would put mines underneath the carpet in people's homes so that they could try to kill innocent people when they return, right? I mean, it's, it's a scorched earth retreat. And some areas, uh, you heard Nick say, it's impossible now to even tell who's in control with this back and forth. What is happening to here as you see it? <clears throat> what, you're, what you're seeing, Aaron, is an attempt by Russia to expand the area that they hold in the Donbass. And truthfully, it's failing. They will come out of there. They will conduct reconnaissance and force maneuver elements will try and go forward. But they then find themselves being attacked by Ukraine. This is a scene from 1916 in the Western Front. It is a, it, Nick used the word stalemate. It is less than that because there is maneuver attempts on both sides. The Russians come forward. They try and occupy a bit of land. The Ukrainian forces, which don't have the mobility as the Russians do, will attack them, and then the Russians will withdraw. And then it's re relegated to an artillery duel back right. and forth. That's what we're seeing. And we're seeing, uh, by all accounts, that Russia is suffering quite a bit of casualties and quite a bit of equipment damage. So this is really boiling down to a war of attrition, which many of us predicted uh, weeks ago, between the two forces. And in my view, Ukraine has the upper hands. They have the better weapons. And they're going up against a force with low morale and the inability to maneuver outside of the Donbass area. 